Welcome back to D20 Tactics. On this channel, I play Dungeons and Dragons with my friends, and we explore combat scenarios and play out the tactics used to defeat monsters quickly and safely, giving you more time to get back to roleplaying. I am your host and Dungeon Master, Sarsen Zero, and this week we have a recap of the dungeon recently completed by Asia Wolf, Blind Oracle, Fear No Equal, and Longfish. First, I'll replay the six encounters that made up the Diabolical Cult, and then we'll talk about the encounters that we thought deserved more commentary. If you've recently watched those encounters, I'll put a timestamp for the start of the discussion in the description below. All of our heroes made it home after this one, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. As the adventurers have made their way back from the various elemental planes throughout the multiverse, they've come back to their home plane and discovered that a Diabolical Cult has taken root there, and so they're going to root out the Diabolical Cult and try to figure out what they're doing hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. I'm holding the Staff of Python and Shield plus one. I have 126 hit points, four level one spell slots, two level two spell slots, three level three spell slots, three level four spell slots, one level five spell slot. And I have both charges of channel Divinity. And then if you're pre-casting any spells. I am pre-casting Hero's Feast. You bring forth our great feast, including the magnificent food and drink. The feast takes an hour to consume and disappears at the end of the time. Up to 12 creatures can partake of the feast. A creature that partakes of the feast gains several benefits. The creature is cured of all diseases and poison, becomes immune to poison and being frightened, and makes all wisdom saving throws with advantage. Its hit point maximum also increases by 2d10. This benefit lasts for 24 hours. For 2d10, we have 15. I am also pre-casting 8 at 5th level. I will target the other 3 party members. Pre-casting a warding bond. I have a pair of rings, so I'll put that on fighter. This spell wards a willing creature you touch and creates a mystic connection between you and the target until the spell ends. While the target is within 60 feet of you, it gains plus 1 bonus to AC and saving throws. It has resistance to all damage. Also, each time it takes damage, you take the same amount of damage. The spell ends if you drop to zero hit points, or if you and the target become separated by more than 60 feet. It also ends if the spell is cast again on either of the connected creatures. You can also dismiss the spell as an action. We have a plus two great axe in hand. We have all of our abilities, our second wind, our action surge, and our indomitable all available. We have 159 hit points. Rogue is holding a plus one short bow in hand and has 134 out of 134 hit points. Asia Wolf has his Wand of the War Mage in hand with his Magic Missile Wand. I'm 109 hit points, 4 first level slots, 3 third, 3 second, 3 fourth, 2 fifth, and 1 sixth. Gonna pop that Mage Armor Scroll and Ritual Casting Water Breathing just in case we run under some water somehow. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. So this is a fallen angel that you guys are fighting against. It's an Aranius, or an Aranis, or however you want to pronounce that. Her name is Aaron. You guys are fighting against Diabolical Cult. That means you're going to go up against a lot of devil fiends. They have resistances to cold, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons that are not silvered. They're immune to fire and poison. They're immune to the poison condition. Her weapons are magical, and they deal an extra 2d8 poison damage. She's a fallen angel, so she can fly for 60 feet. She has a long sword that she can make three attacks with. She has a long bow that she can make three attacks with. If she hits you with a long bow, you can be poisoned, and the poison lasts until it is removed. We're all immune to poison. You are, are immune to poison damage. You're not immune to the poison condition, but you are going to ignore her hellish weapon poison. That's certainly true. I think we are not immune to the damage, although I will admit that's a problem in 5e. Following the precedent set forth by Sage Advice Compendium, immune to poison includes both the condition and the damage type. Easily done. Cool. Oh, well then. So you're going to be immune to her poison. Thank you for that. And keeping me honest. She has a parry ability, so she can use her reaction to increase her AC against one melee attack. Probably not going to be very helpful. Terrain and effects. So it's the outside of the cult temple, sprung up in the middle of the city under the guise of being something else. There's a couple of pillars in front that you cannot pass diagonally through, but you can move around. A bunch of pieces of difficult terrain over here and a bunch of pieces of impassable terrain that represent the building. What do you guys think for tactics in this encounter? Stay away from that sword. <laughs> well, the bow is just as bad, sadly. Does she have fly speed? She has a 60 foot fly speed. Yeah, I guess, I mean, my primary concern is just keeping her in range. You know, we can just throw things at her if she goes up. Otherwise, try and keep her off the squishies like usual, but that's going to be very difficult. Yeah, those three hits are going to hurt. Hopefully she won't kill the owl. That owl's dead. That owl never stood a chance. I thought about not saying it, and I was like, nah, he's learned that lesson too many times. One more rules question before we keep going. Does she have blindsight of any varietal? She has true sight of 120 feet. 
Monster with True Sight can out to a specific range, see in normal and magical darkness, see invisible creatures and objects, and automatically detect visual illusions and succeed on saving throws against them, and perceive the original form of a shape changer or creature that is transformed by magic. Furthermore, the monster can see into the ethereal plane within the same range. I don't see anything about this that would allow them to see a hidden creature. If your hide was granted strictly by the fact that you were invisible and you had no concealment, that probably wouldn't work. Correct. If it was granted by dim light or darkness, it probably wouldn't work. If it was granted by an illusion, it wouldn't work. But if it's entirely mundane hiding, I don't see that True Sight's going to fix anything. Thank you. Just wanted to check. What plane are we on? What plane are you on? You're on the Prime Material Plane. And she is not a native of the Prime Material Plane. Let's go ahead and roll some initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? Who's got between a 20? Wait a minute. I have higher than a 20. I got a 21. Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? Rogue is an 18. Fighter with 16. 15 for the wizard. I have a 14 minus 1. Ow. He's got a big old 9. Aaron is going to go first. She's got a 60-foot fly that she's going to take. She's going to fly to here. She's going to stare at you and shoot you with a bow. She only has a plus 7 to hit. Let's down the owl first. 18 to hit the owl. Yeah. Her minimum damage is 4. Also, she's going to do a bunch of poison damage, so the owl's probably dead. He's only got one life. After that, she's going to target wizard. I think you have the lowest hit points. Nat 20 to hit you. Yeah, that's going to hit no matter what I do. Take 8 points of piercing damage and a bunch of points of poison damage that you ignore. Second attack, she's going to get a 14 to hit you. After that, she's going to move behind this pillar here. After that, we're going to go to the rogue. We're going to go ahead and move behind the pillar, sort of into the crates there if we can. Take the hide bonus action, 24. Yep, your minimum is 23, her passive perception is 12, you're always going to make it. We're just going to ignore that roll from then on in, and then we're going to standard action, shoot her with a bow. If I can see her. Yep, you can see her, though she doesn't have cover. Okay. Oof. 14 to hit. Miss. Yeah. Okay, turn. After that, we go to the fear. Advance 30 feet and dodge, because we're not going to be able to get to her, and I want to be out in the middle where I can move to wherever she goes. And that's it for me. After the fear is the Asia Wolf. Can I move south of the road, please? And I think I counted that to be 60. I'm 55, but yes. Not that I'm thinking this is going to work, but let's try banishment. Tell me about it. DC 17 charisma save. She has magic resistance. She'll have advantage on saving throws against spells or magical effects. That's what I said. I don't think it'll work, but hey. Her charisma save is plus 8. I rolled a 1 and a 6. 8 plus 6 is 14, which is not enough, and that's that encounter. I am holding it for a minute. <laughs> wow, I was totally not expecting that to work. <laughs> Report hit points. 159 out of 159. 134 out of 134. 126 out of 126. 101 out of 109. <laughs> Not a great showing from the single target monster. Anybody doing anything at the end of the encounter, this is not a rest. Fall into the ground in shock. Congratulating <laughs> the wizard. Rogue, you gonna go pick up an arrow? I... No. It doesn't meet the minimum threshold to pick up an arrow, because you only get half back. <laughs> the adventurers are gonna make their way deeper into the diabolical cult temple. Looks like they're riding pretty high on that first encounter and I think they know what they're going to do. So we'll see if they're going to be able to make it through the rest of it. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. Plus one short bow in hand. 134 out of 134 hit points. 101 out of 109 in hand is my wand of the war mage and my wand of magic missiles. Four level first, three second, three third, two fourths now, two fifth, one six. I'm currently at 126 out of 126. I am holding my Staff of Python and Shield plus one. I have four level one, two level two, three level three, three level four, and one level five spell slots remain. And both charges on my channel diminish. I am at 159 of 159 hit points, and I have my Pike plus one in hand because I want reach. Second Wind, Action Surge, and Indomitable all available. Monsters, abilities, and numbers. This encounter has four barbed devils and two hellhounds. Barbed devils have diabolical resistances. They resist cold damage. They're resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons that are not silvered. They're immune to fire and poison damage and the poison condition. They have dark vision and their passive perception is 18, so the rogue is not going to worry about that. They have magic resistance. Doesn't seem like it's going to help them much. They have a barb <laughs> to hide, so if you grapple them, you're going to take 1d10 damage. And multi-attack, they can hurl flame, or they can make attacks with their tails and claws. Hellhounds are 
are smaller fiends. They use pack tactics. They have advantage on attack rolls against a creature if at least one of their allies is within five feet of the creature. They have a fire breath for a 15 foot cone. It's on a five, six recharge and it does 6d6 fire damage. They can also bite and they do some fire damage on the bite. They have fire immunity, but they don't have diabolical immunity. Their passive perception is 15. Terrain and effects. This terrain has some enclosed areas sort of arena style encounter. In the middle, there are a number of spikes. The spikes are dangerous terrain. If you are forced into them, you will take 2d6 piercing damage. If you just move into them voluntarily, it's only difficult terrain. The statues are difficult terrain to move through, but you can stand on them, climb on them. Stairs up here and stairs down here. So it's a five foot gap up and a five foot gap down. So a total of 10 feet if you fall off the areas on the top. Doors are currently closed, but they can be open. After that, we're going to go to tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? I hate to be the guy who's suggesting it, but what if we stack up in the top left corner and let them come to us? Because that's a lot of devils with clean lines of fire. The only issue with stacking is that breath attack. If we put the wizard and the rogue at the very top edge and the cleric stands 20 feet in front of them, they won't get hit by the breath attack. Unless the hellhound gets past them, in which case bigger issues. I think some of that'll depend on how quickly we can clear out. And let them come through the doors to us. Yeah, that works. My one reservation is if they get the jump on us, we're gonna have to disentangle ourselves to get into position, but that's not the end of the world. I would note that these doors are currently closed, so they're gonna have to come to us even if they have the initiative advantage on us to open those doors. So the doors give us maybe a full turn to get into position. I might stand behind the column rather than in front of the squishies and see if I can use that additional reach I've got to throw down a lot of attacks of opportunity. Probably haste you too. Let's go ahead and roll initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anybody have between a 15 and a 20? 17 on the fighter. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? 13 minus 1. 12 on the rogue. Anybody have between a 10 and a 5? I got an 8. 7 for the devils. Wow. Fighter, you're up first. <laughs> I will reposition 2 west and 2 north so that I'm next to the rogue. And then I will prepare to hit the first enemy that comes within reach of me, which is 10 foot reach. All right. After the fear, we go to the longfish. Move me diagonal to northwest one space. I'm preparing to cast Sacred Flame on the first enemy that comes through the door. After the longfish, we're going to go to the blind oracle. So we're going to move on the diagonal behind the cleric. Take a bonus action to hide, and then prepare an action to shoot the first enemy that comes through the door. After that, we're going to go to the Asia Wolf. Can I move five north, please? And I will prep Ray of Frost on the first enemy that I can see. Barbed Devils are going to move. They have a movement speed of 30. This guy's going to go to here, open the door. That will proc. It's going to be plus five cover from the rogue. Do you take it? You allowed to hang on to your reaction? Yes. I would hang on to it then. That's a rough shot to take. Cleric, you don't care about cover. Dex 17 save. Yep, he fails. For 9 radiant damage. Wizard, he's got plus 5 from you. You can hang on to it. That's a 21. Hits. That is a 13 plus a 5 from the int modifier, so 18. He resists cold, so he's going to take 9. He's going to hurl flame at the fighter. Fighter, does a 12 hit you? Negative. Does a nat 20 hit you? Yeah. Take 19 points of fire damage. Yeah, okay. Did you have the resistance? You resist damage. Instead of 19, you're going to take 9, and Cleric, you're also going to take 9. Okay. All right, this is going to get interesting. We're going to do the same thing over here. That one I'm taking. Does a 28 hit? Yep. For 27 points of damage. Two more at the fighter. 7 to hit you. Negative. 18 to hit you. Also negative. He's going to back up for 5 feet. This guy's going to dash to here. This guy's going to dash to here. Hellhounds. They have a 50-foot movement speed. This guy's going to dash to here and do fire breath on the cleric and rogue. This, you guys have spaced out perfectly so that he cannot 15-foot cone both of you. Give me a DC 12 dexterity save. 17. That'll pass, and you have evasion, so you don't take anything. I have an 11. Take 26 points of fire damage. And then this guy's going to back up to there. This guy's going to rush to there. He's going to breathe on the fighter. Fighter, give me a DC 12 dexterity save. Negative, that's a 9. Take 25 points of fire damage, except you're going to take half. You take 12. Cleric, you take 12. And then he's going to go one back. That's all my guys. Top of the order. Fear, you're up. I'm going to push forward one space diagonally southeast. And let's go ahead and lay into this guy. First attack. 19 to hit. Hits. For 16 damage. Second attack. 14 to hit. 14 to miss. Third attack. And that is a 12 to hit. Miss. You know what? We're going to action surge. Just do it. 
to it now, get it out of the way. That is a crit. Yep. 16 damage. 18 to hit. Hits. 15 damage. Last attack. 26 to hit. Hits. 12 damage. I will bonus action my second wind. D10 plus 12 HP for 16 HP recovered. Okay. Any movement? No, I'll stay right where I am. After that, you're going to go to the longfish. Action. Move me southeast one square, and I'm going to cast a Spirit Guardian at 5th level. That's beautiful, actually. That will be it for me. After the longfish, we're going to go to the blind oracle. So let's go ahead and move south 3, so the diagonal behind the fighter. Let's go ahead and shoot the fighter's target. A 15 to hit. Takes 8. Back, please. No bonus action. You got it. After that, we're going to go to the Azure Wolf. Pull out one of my scrolls of haste and pop it on the rogue here. Haste on the rogue. You got it. Anything else? That's it. Now it's my turn. So I'm going to have a bunch of guys start off in the zone. Tell me about it. Wisdom 17 save. Cool. These guys need 12. They have resistance because they got plus 5 wisdom. They're going to pass. Give me some damage. 23 damage. 23 cut in half to 11. He's going to make two attacks at the cleric with his hurl flame. First one's a 16. Miss. Second one's a 20. Hit. Take 10 points of fire damage and a concentration save. Not 20. Now 20 will do it. He's going to back out. After that, we're going to go to this next guy. Give me some damage. For a total of 60 damage. And then he's going to do the same thing. Nat 1's going to fail, but Nat 20's going to hit. Yep. A lot of 1s and 20s in this. 18 damage and a concentration save. 17. Then he's going to back up. After that, we're going to go to this next guy. He's going to take some damage first. Tell me about it. Hey, that's a good one. 30 damage. Pass it with double 21, so he's going to take 15. Then he's going to throw two fire... A 11 and a 17. Both miss. He's going to back up. He's going to start his turn off in the zone. Passes the save. 28 shortens to 14. Then he's going to throw two at the fighter. Fighter a 14 to hit you. Negative. And a 20 to hit you. That one will do. Take 8, which is going to turn to 4, and 4 to the cleric. Cleric, give me another concentration save. 15. I'm sorry, did he leave my threatened radius? Yep, he did. He did. Foolishly, he did. That's a 27 to hit. Hits. For 15 damage. That's lethal. I messed that up. Should not have done that. Hellhound is going to try to recharge its fire breath. Failed to do so. I don't need to throw him away like I threw away the other guy. So he's going to back up to there. This guy's going to dodge. This Hellhound is going to try to recharge his fire breath. He's going to fail to do so. He will also back up and get ready. This guy's going to dodge. After that, we're going to go to the top of the order, which is the fear. Longfish, we going in. Okay. I am swapping to my great axe. Yep. Drop the pike on the ground. And bring me right into the center of their line. We're going to start on the northernmost guy. 18 to hit. Hits. For 19 damage. Second attack. 18 to hit again. Hits. 18 damage. Third attack. That is a 23 to hit for 17 damage. You good? Yeah, I don't have a bonus action, so we're good. After the fear is the longfish. Move me forward one square and then diagonal right under the fighter. Action dodge. Bonus action spiritual weapon to the south hellhound. 15 to hit? Yes. For 10 force damage. After that, we're going to go to the blind oracle. So I'm hasted. Means I have an extra action. My haste action is to shoot the one in front of the fighter. 27 to hit. Hits. 28 points of damage. Let's move behind the pillar with the rest of my movement because I have a ton of it now. Bonus action, hide. Ready action, if something attacks the fighter, attack it. After the blind oracle was the Asia Wolf. Let's move to that column north of the rogue. I'm going to target the middle one with Ray of Frost. That's a 21. Hits. That is another 13 plus 5, so 18. 18 points of damage. That'll cut in half to 9 because they resist it. After that, we're going to go to the... Oh, it's my turn now. We are immune to fire, so let's start off with the Hellhounds. Hellhound is going to try to recharge. He recharges successfully. He's got to dive into the zone. That's unfortunate, but it is what it is. He's going to go to there. Give me some damage. 29 damage. 29. Good God. Okay. And he is not a full devil, so he does not have magic resistance. He's going to take the entire 29. Both of you give me DC 12 dexterity saves. 18. 14 on fighter. You're both going to pass. You're only going to take half of this. 25, so you're going to take 12. Fighter, you resist that, so you're going to take 6. And the cleric is going to take 12 and 18. I guess those would be simultaneous. What do you think? Is that the same hit or is that different hits for concentration? Different sources, I'd say. Different sources. Sounds good. First one is an 18. Second one is a 16. And then he's going to move back out. Does that trigger the rogue? I'm trying to get the barb devils. So something attacking the fighter. Yeah. That guy's going to move into the zone. He fails. 20 damage. I should have checked to see if it recharged before he moved in. 
he fails to recharge, so he's just going to go fight <laughs> the cleric. And he has advantage because of pack tactics. Dodge, so cancel out. I got a 22 to hit you. I will hit. Takes six points of piercing and five points of fire for a total of 11. Con save is a 11. After that, we're going to go to the barb devils. Barb devils are going to go after the cleric. So he's going to move to there and attack the cleric. That's an attack of opportunity? Uh, it is an attack of opportunity. I was hoping to avoid those. Yep. That is a 21 to hit. Hits. For 19 damage. He also starts his turn in the zone. He does indeed start his turn off in the zone. Thank you. He passes. 16 and a half to 8. He's going to make his attack against the cleric. I need to crack that zone. First one is a 16 to hit you. Miss. Second one is a 15 to hit you. Missed. And the third one is a 21 to hit you. That will hit. The tail attack is going to do 10 points of piercing damage. Um, 13. This guy's going to start his turn off in the zone. He's going to pass. 27, half to 13. Three attacks. First one is a 14. Missed. Second one is a 18. Missed. Third one is 17. Missed. Third guy. Start his turn off in the zone. 16, which I think is a failure. So 26 damage. 26, and that is lethal. That guy drops. After that, we're going to go to the top of the order, which is the fear. Two paces to the right, and we're going to wail on this center guy. First attack, you. 14 to hit. That misses. Second attack, that's a crit. 26 total. Third attack, a 22 to hit. Yep. For my actual minimum damage of 10. And that is it for me. After the fear is the longfish. Action, channel divinity. If I'm going to heal myself for 55. Bonus action, move the spiritual weapon up. 15 to hit. Hits. For 10 damage. Lethal. And turn. After that, we're going to go to the blind oracle. Go ahead and move south two squares. We're going to shoot the barbed devil with the haste action. 27 to hit. 27 hits. For 33 points of damage. Man, it's really hard because you can play Mother May I with the... The reaction attack is the problem. Let's go behind the pillar, hide bonus action. As my regular action, I would like to ready an attack on the first enemy that moves inside the Spirit Guardians. After the Blind Oracle, we go to the Asia Wolf. Pop out, hit that Hellhound just north of the fighter with Magic Missile. Cast it at its second level, and we're doing two plus the five. One plus one is two, plus five for the intelligence is seven. Seven times four is 28. To this guy, he's going to take 28, and he's going to drop. Jump back. Uh, yep. Hellhound's going to start his turn off in the zone. 24 damage. And that is lethal to the Hellhound. He fails his save. Barb Devil's going to start his turn off in the zone. 19 damage. He passes the save. 19 is half to 9. Then he's going to attack the Cleric. First attack is a 21 to hit your Cleric. No hit. Claw is going to do 7 points of piercing damage. Give me a save. 13. Second attack is an 11. No a miss. Third attack is a 16. No a miss. That's all my guys. Fear you're up. Close in and kill. 17 to hit yep. for 10 damage. Second attack. 22 to hit for 11 damage. Yep. 17 to hit for 10 damage. Man, that was some of the worst rolls I am capable of. Regardless, it's lethal. That's the end of the encounter. Report hit points. 144 of 159. 56 out of 126. 134 out of 134. 101 out of 109. This is the short rest, pre-rest actions. Then it's going to go on to hit dice. Going to throw two. Eight total. Doing three. I gained 15. Seven hit dice and healing for 57. Any post-rest actions. The adventurers have made their way into the first chamber and had their worst fears confirmed. Devils have in fact infested this area and they'll have to clear them out. Hit points, ability, spells, items in hand... Fighter. I have 159 of 159 hit points. I have a Great Axe plus 2 in hand. I have my Second Wind and my Action Surge available, as well as my Indomitable. And I no longer have Warning Bond. Plus 1 Short Bow in hand. 134 out of 134 hit points. I have 113 out of 126 hit points. I'm holding the Staff of Python and Shield plus 1. I have 4 level 1, 1 level 2, 3 level 3, 3 level 4 spell slots remaining, and both charges of my channel divinity. 109 out of 109. I have 5 charges left on the Wand of Magic Missiles. I have all 4 first, all 3 second, all 3 third, 2 remaining 4th. Two remaining fifth and one six level slot. I have my arcane recovery still and my pearl of power. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has two chain devils and accompanying them are three imps. Chain devils are diabolical fiends, so they resist cold damage, non-magical, non-silvered weapon damage. They are immune to fire and poison. They're immune to the poison condition. 
They have dark vision and passive perception of 11, so rogues are happy here. Magic resistance like devils do. Multi-attack with chains with a 10-foot reach. They can also grapple. Their grappling restrains. It also does damage. They have a reaction that they can use. They have an unnerving mask. When a creature the devil sees starts its turn within 30 feet, if the creature can see the devil, it makes a DC 14 wisdom save versus frightened until the end of its turn. How do you guys feel about being frightened? We're immune to We're it. We're immune, immune to, to it. it. Why is that? Here is feast. Great. So that's an ability that I'm not going to get to use. And then there's a couple of imps. Imps are shape changers. They can sting and bite for some poison damage. How do you feel about poison damage? Immune to poison damage. Uh, it's just another Sunday. <laughs> yeah, they can turn invisible, which is fun. I think that might show up. They are full diabolical fiends, so they have magic resistance, cold resistance, immunity to fire, and poison to the poison condition. Non-magical, non-silvered weapons. Terrain, pretty basic terrain. You're gonna slosh through some blood red water on the sides, but it's not actually difficult terrain. The statues completely block the area, unlike the previous ones you encountered. And then there's some statues here that you can hide behind. Can't move diagonally through, but you can move around. Any questions about the terrain here? A question on what I'm seeing on the map. There appear to be like low rise walls those doors or something or this just is that just an artifact of the map yeah it's just a low-rise wall like a handrail or something like that but not difficult terrain no no difficult terrain on this map after that we're going to go to tactics close in tactics what are you guys going to do here i completely forgot to ritual cast the familiar they don't have range they don't really they come to us yeah you're a little tapped out on high-end spell slots Low-end spirit guardians might be nice. We can definitely try and keep the big guys from the squishies, because grappling is going to mess them up pretty bad. Yeah, I can try some crowd control. I was hoping that you might go ahead and, like, pop off chain lightning or something and just clear those imps real fast. Or burn a six-level slot, or try a hypnotic pattern, which would incapacitate them. Doesn't that affect us? If you're not in the area. The imps also only have 10 HP a pop. Yeah. Yeah, so we clear those off with an AoE, and then focus on the the big guys we might try if we can disabling one of them some control or disablement on one of them and then just focus down the other though the first one is being relatively useless if i go to hypnotic pattern route it's a 30 foot cube or i could go polymorph and just single target one i'd say polymorph it's save or suck but you know that would put somebody completely out of the fight for a while yeah basically hypnotic pattern does the same until we hit them or break them. Would we be able to melee engage with them if you hypnotic pattern them? Or would we be stuck outside the pattern? So the pattern goes away once it's cast. So what happens is they're incapacitated until you hit them. Or you lose concentration. Let's go ahead and roll initiative then. Uh, that looks more familiar. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anybody have between a 15 and a 20? 17 for the devils. 15 for the wizard. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? 12 minus 1 on the clerk. Who's got between a 10 and a 5? 7 for the fighter. 7 for the rogue. Top of the order is the devils. Immediately, the imps are going to turn invisible with their action because they don't want to get murked. They have a fly speed of 40, so they're going to go invisible and fly somewhere. And then this guy's going to go invisible, fly over here. And then this guy's going to go invisible and fly over here. Chain devils have a movement of 30 feet, and with a 10-foot reach, he's going to hit you with the chains. 19 to hit. No miss. 18 to hit. No will miss. Other side, same thing. 11 to hit you, fighter. Miss. 23 to hit you. That'll hit. Take 9 points of slashing damage. You are grappled. Your speed is 0. You are restrained. And at the start of your turn, you're going to take 2d6 piercing damage. After that, we go to the wizard. Not knowing where the stuff is, I still think it's beneficial to cast the 30-foot cube on that one to the west. Because he's got the guy grappled, so let's do a hypnotic pattern on him. So you blast this area here. I'm going to make a save with the chain double, DC. Wisdom, DC 17. He's got a plus 4, and he has magic resistance, so he needs 13 on one of these. He's going to fail with a 12 on one of them. He's incapacitated. His little impy friend... He's going to get a 7, so he's going to get incapacitated as well. He is effectively concentrating on a spell of invisibility, so he's going to become visible. That's an action. What else you got? I think I'm good right where I am. After the Azure Wolf is the Longfish. Action. Casting a third level. Spirit Guardian. Enter. After that, we're going to go to Fear No Equal. Move to the southeast of the... If only you weren't grappled. If only I was grappled. I'm going to regret saying that. Because <laughs> incapacitated <laughs> creatures do not continue grappling. Sorry, you were going to go where? I'm going to move to the southeast of the other Chain Devil. We're going to attack this guy. Attack number one. That's an 18 to hit for 10 damage. Second attack. 26 to hit for 13 damage. Third attack. That is a 24 to hit for 16 damage. 
and that will be it for me. After that, we're going to go to Blind Oracle. Bonus action, hide. Regular action, shoot. Using the cleric as my hiding post. 27 to hit. Hits. For 33 points of damage. That's my turn. After the Blind Oracle is the top of the order. We're going to start with imps. The imps are going to... Start their turn off in his own. Tell me about it. Wisdom 17 safe for 30 damage. Fails with a 5, so that's going to drop him. The other guy is going to move to here. He's going to help the Chain Devil with the fighter, so the Chain Devil will have advantage on the first attack. That removes his invisibility, right? I don't know that it does. It's not an attack and it's not a spell. But you faint, distract, or in some other way team up to make your allies attack more effective. I don't see anything about this being an attack and it's certainly not a spell. In the meantime, he's going to go fly away from there around this corner. The Chain Devil's going to start his turn off in the zone. Oof, 17 damage. He passes, so he's going to take half of 17 is 8. First attack with advantage against the fighter. He's going to get a 27 to hit you, fighter. That'll hit. No oh, max damage. 16 slashing. You are grappled. You are restrained. At the start of your turn, you'll take 2d6 unless some shenanigans happens. I'm sure it will. And then he's going to attack the wizard to try to break concentration. He's going to get a 21 to hit you, wizard. Oh, that's a shield. After that, we're going to go to the other chain devil. Starts to turn off in the zone. He's going to fail. And take 16 damage. He is no longer incapacitated because he took damage. He's going to go after the cleric, I guess, to crack the spell. I think the wizard is still the highest threat here, so we're going to go after the wizard. 20 to hit you. That's a miss because your AC is now 22. 18 to hit you, also a miss for the exact same reason. After that, we're going to go to the other imp. Oh, he's in cap, so that's not going to happen there. After all of my guys, we go to the Age of Wolf. Let's try to burn this one on the right down. So let's cast third level magic missile. Let's charge yourself. Just looked and see. That'll put me at five. That is a three on the die. Three plus one is four. Four plus five is nine. Nine times five is 45. So this guy's going to take 45 points of damage and drop. Thanks. Yep. Some shenanigannery did happen. I'm going to go northeast just past the call up there of the fighter. Provoking an attack of opportunity as you leave his threatened square. Does a 20 hit you? Nope. Why is that? Oh, wait, it does because a uh... shield drops at the beginning of your turn. Yeah, so we'll put it back up. Okay, so you're going to use another reaction, bring up another shield. After the Azure Wolf is the Longfish. Put me directly east of the Chain Devil, and I will hit him with a Sacred Flame. Dex 17 safe. He's got advantage on this, but his dex is not good enough, he's going to fail. For 14 damage. That'll be it. After the long fish is the fear no equal. Can I go to the far side of the devil? I'll just go there and lock him down. First attack. That is a 15 to hit. It's a mess, sorry. Second attack is a 28 to hit for 19 damage. Third attack is a 17 to hit. Yep. For a 14 damage. And we will save the action surge for another time. After the fear no equal is the blind oracle. Curse these short stubby legs. If only you have boots of speed. Yeah, they take a bonus action to activate, which is kind of at a premium. But we will use them. Bonus action to activate the boots of speed, so I double my movement speed for the turn, for what it's worth. Any creature that makes an attack of opportunity against me has disadvantage on the attack roll for the next minute. He's already oppied. It applies for the whole minute, though, so it's useful if it comes up later. And then let's go north? Question mark? <laughs> yeah, let's go straight north. Stay within the zone, or? Yeah, in the zone. And then take the shot at the chain double. 16 to hit. 16 is what you need. Ooh, 31 points of damage. Lethal. There you go. You got some more movement. You can hang out there. Let's go hang out next to the wizard, then, on the other side of the column. That was the blind oracle. All right, two imps. No waiting. Let's start with this guy, because it's going to be quick. Tell me about it. Seven things save. Fails. 14 damage. Dead. The other one is going to jump out of hiding and attack the rogue. He's got advantage on this attack. He's going to get a 21 to hit you. That will hit. Take seven points of piercing damage. Okay. And eight points of poison damage. <laughs> <laughs> that I ignore, thanks to Hero's Feast. And then I'm going to use Uncanny Dodge to half the attack's damage. Uh, are you, though? Uncanny. Uh, from an attacker, you can see, which you cannot do because he's invisible when he attacks you. All right. I'll take the seven. <laughs> You're taking a whole extra four damage. I'm sure you'll live. You know, I would like to use my buttons, man. That's true. You have the buttons. You want to use them. After that, we're going to go to the Azure Wolf. I can see this guy. Let's Ray of Frost. A 15? 15 hits. For 12. Plus the five, so 17. Cut in half. After that, we're going to go to the Longfish. Move me diagonally up next to the Fiend. 
and then uh, Sacred Flame him. Deck 17. He's going to pass with a 19. Alright, then I do nothing. Fear. I'll just walk over next to Cleric. And we're just going to chop at it with an axe. Does a 17 hit him? Yep. For 16 damage. Dead. Bye bye. Report hit points. 109, 109. 113 out of 126. 134 of 159. 127 of 134. Any end of encounter actions? Activate the Pearl of Power. What are you getting back? Third level. Yeah, throwing down my second wind for 16 recovered health. Recover arrows. It's that time. They have descended down to the second layer of the cultist temple and hear all manner of evil nonsense up ahead of them. So they're going to clear out the area beyond and see what's going on. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. Wizard. I am 109 out of 109. I have my wand of the war mage plus one, along with my wand of magic pencils. Two slots remaining on the first three, second, two third, two fourth, two fifth, one sixth. I am at 113 out of 126 hit points. I am holding the staff of the python and shield plus one. I have four level one, one level two, three level three, and three level four spell slots remaining, and both charges of my channel divinity. 150 of 159 hit points. Action Surge and Indomitable both available. And a Great Axe plus 2 in hand. 127 of 134 hit points, holding a plus 1 short. Sneak dice all day. Sneak dice all day, baby. How excited are you for your level 20 once per short rest ability so you'll be able to say it for exactly one dungeon? Dead. 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 Head shake. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. So this encounter has a Horned Devil. Horned Devil is a relatively powerful devil among the ones that you're going to be fighting here today. They've got diabolical resistances, so they resist cold, unsilvered, and non-magical weapons. They're immune to fire, immune to poison, immune to the poison condition. Passive perception is 13, so well below a rogue's ability to care. They have magic resistance, as all devils do. They have multi-attack, where they can attack twice with their fork. And they have a tail attack. The tail attack, in addition to some damage, if you are not an undead or construct, you have to make a DC 17 constitution save or lose 3d6 hit points at the start of every turn due to an infernal wound. If I hit you again, the amount that you lose increases by 3d6. You can take an action to staunch the wound with a successful DC 12 medicine check or some sort of magical healing. They also have the ability to hurl flame like the barbed devils did and they can substitute any of their melee attacks for ranged attacks if they so choose. The horned devil is accompanied by a succubus that has been taking part in the rituals here. I'm going to use them properly this time, seven levels later, so let's take a look. Succubi have resistance to cold, fire, lightning, poison, and non-magical weapon attacks. Passive perception 15, 60 foot fly speed, they can claw, they can draining kiss if you're charmed, and then importantly, they can charm you with a DC 15 wisdom save, and then you become magically charmed for a day. The charmed target obeys the fiend's verbal or telepathic commands. They have telepathy for 60 feet. If the target suffers any harm or receives a suicidal command, it can repeat the saving throw, ending this effect on a success. If you succeed on any of the saves against it, you are immune to the effect for 24 hours. The Horned Devil has fly, or I didn't miss that part. You are correct. The Horned Devil has a fly speed of 60. Terrain and effects. So a couple of pieces of difficult terrain. If you stumble across them, they will slow you down. The piles of bodies are difficult terrain. I'll just announce that and leave that as it is. And then there's a bunch of pieces of walls and impassable terrain. Any questions about the terrain? Are we in an interior space? Yes. How high is the ceiling? 15 feet up. Cool. So he can't fly away from us. Let's go ahead and talk about tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? I think it would behoove us to clear the succubus first if we can. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, focus right down. Cleric, you might be on call for that medicine check. Magical healing works. So healing word will do it. The other thing is we have advantage on wisdom saves. Yep. So yeah, we may be tougher for her to uh, seduce than would otherwise be expected. I'm just concerned about that tail attack. If that hits us a couple of times, that's going to be a real problem. But yeah, I think if we can take down that succubus fast, then we should. The haste you fighter, just have you go your nova around. This is another two-person fight. Do we have a disable that would work on one or the other? Banishment. Yeah, I was going to say banishment or polymorph. Think I can get thrice lucky? <laughs> Probably not. That magic resistance is the kicker here. Yeah. I've gotten lucky twice. I don't know if I can pull it off for three. <laughs> I mean, it's worth a shot. I, I agree. I've got the slot. So, I mean. Hold monster? 
I don't think anybody here has one monster. Mm, okay. All right, let's go ahead and roll initiative then. Anybody have higher than a 20? I got a 20 on the fiends. Who's got between a 20 and a 15? 19 minus 1 on the clerk. 19 on the fighter. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? Okay. Who's got between a 10 and a 5? 9. 8. All right, the fiends are going to go first. I think we want to do the succubus first. Succubus is going to fly out to there, and she's going to attempt to charm the cleric. Give me a DC 15 wisdom save. With advantage, 28. Okay, and yeah, that'll pass, I suppose. I'll let it go by this time. And then she's got 60 feet of movement, so she's going to fly back in here. You are immune to that effect for the next 24 hours. After that is the Horn Devil. The Horn Devil is going to probably go after you as well, so drop in right there. Fork you once with the staff, or at least attempt to 16 to hit. That will miss. Second attack, nat 20. That will hit. Take 13 points of piercing damage. Concentrating on anything? Nope. And the tail attack. Tail attacks a 27. <laughs> that will hit. Take 10 points of piercing damage. Give me a DC 17 constitution save. 24. 24. So you do not get the infernal wound. He's got 60 feet of movement, so he's going to fly back. After that, we're going to go to Cleric. Put me four squares to the west of the Horn Devil, and I will cast Sacred Flame on the Succubus. Dex 17. Well, she rolled a 17. Yeah, it doesn't have a negative, so she passes. All right, that's it for my turn. After the cleric, we're going to go to the fear. I will dash to the succubus. Put me on the far side of her, please. And that'll be it for me. After that, we're going to go to the Asia Wolf. Let's move north. Don't think I'm going to get race lucky, so let's aim for the lady with third level magic missile. Looking at a three. Three plus one is four. Four plus five is nine. Nine times five is 45 points of damage to her. Three back, or are you good there? Yeah, let's move three back. After that is a blind oracle. So we're going to move on the diagonal to the cleric, and then we're going to hide from the succubus behind the cleric and then shoot the succubus. Does a 25 hit? Yep. Respectable. For 30 points of damage? 30 points of damage lethal. My attempt to cover and cower did not work. Can I pop back behind the column? After that, we're going to go to the top of the order, which is the Horned Devil. Horned Devil screeches something at you, infuriated that you have banished its concubine, and it's going to attack you. We're going to focus on the same target. 29 to hit you, Cleric. Double hit. Oh, that was good. Take 21 points of piercing from the fork. Hey, I have 69 health. 27 to hit you. Double hit. 19 points of damage from the fork. Tail attack is a 12, which will miss. And after that, we're going to fly there, not provoking an attack of opportunity, because we're going to skate along the edge here. After that, we're going to go to the turn of the longfish. Put me south, I'm the devil, and I will hit him with a eh, sacred flame. Dex 17. He fails with a 15. For a measly 7 damage. That's it for me. After the long fish, we go to the fear. I will move into the center of the room, and I'm going to swap over to my pike and prepare to attack him if he comes within reach of me. Sounds good. After the fear is the age wolf. Okay. Let's haste the fighter with a scroll. And then jump back. Yep. Go Nova. After the age wolf, we have the blind oracle. Let's go ahead and move on behind the fighter. Hide behind the fighter. Fighter's vibrations are distracting, but even with the 23, you still make it. And then take the shot. Oh, so close. A 29 to hit? 29 hits. So close. For 36 points of damage. And we'll hang out there. After the blind oracle is the horn devil. Horn devil's going to attack the cleric. First attack is a 17. That will miss. Second attack is a 25. That will hit. Take 16 points of piercing damage. And then the third attack with the tail is a 22. That will hit. Take 13 points of piercing damage. DC 17 constitution save. That will be a 16. 16 is a fail, so you're going to take 3d6 at the start of your turn. Now it's your turn, so go ahead and take... <laughs> Brutal. 11 points of... Uh, oh, you just lose 11 hit points. Are you still up? Still up. 10 out of 126. <laughs> now it's your full turn. What do you do? Channel Divinity. Heal up a whole bunch of hit points. You're going to take the entire 60. 53. All right, that's an action. What else you got? I will stay there. After the long fish, we go to the beer. Close in. Put me right center. And we are going to use our action surge and just wail on him. Attack number one with the pike. So that's a 24 to hit. 24 hits. For 16 damage. Attack number two. 28 to hit. 28 hits. For 16 damage. 21 to hit. Yep. For 15 damage. 20 to hit for 16 damage. Attack number five. 19 to hit. Yep. For 11 damage. Attack six. 
23 to hit. Yeah. 9 damage. Attack number 7. This is the haste attack. 27 to hit for 9 damage. Okay, he's allowed to leave. He's allowed to leave now? Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> what a waste of a turn. Asia Wolf. Yeah, let's fire a magic missile at this guy. Another third. I am looking at four. You're looking at four. Four plus one is five. Five plus five is ten. Ten times five is fifty. Fifty is lethal. Bye-bye. That's that encounter. So, this is the fourth encounter, so it's a short rest. Report hit points remaining. 63 out of 126. 150 of 159. 109. 127 of 134. Any pre-rest actions? Chuck both of my healing potions. First one is eight. Second one is also eight. Anyone else want to take pre-rest actions? Pearl of Power to get my third level slot. Sounds good. Hit dice. Spending one hit die to gain five hit points. Two hit dice for nine hit points. I'm spending five hit dice for 38 hit points. In my rest, I'm doing the ritual cast of the fine familiar and the arcane recovery what do you bring back for arcane recovery fourth level slot and two first level slots handing two potions over to the cleric long fish you drinking them i'll drink one of them for now healing for another eight i am now at 125 out of 126 yeah i figured you'd have the other one to spare if you need it i will also hand the cleric two healing potions the adventurers have discovered the grisly fate of some of the townsfolk who have gone missing in the area and discovered the intentions of the devil worshippers here. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. I am currently at 125 out of 126 hit points. I have my Staff of the Python and Shield plus one in hand. I have four level one, one level two, three level three, and three level four spell slots remaining and both charges of my channel divinity. 159 of 159 hit points. I have a Great Axe plus two in hand, my second wind, action surge, and still have my Indomitable available. 109 out of 109. I have my Wand of the War Mage plus one. Wand of Magic Missiles with two charges remaining. I have four level first level slots, three level two slots, one third level slot, three fourth, two fifth, one sixth. 132 out of 134 hit points holding a plus one short bow. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. It's been an hour later because they took a short rest, so larger and more terrifying fiends have been summoned here. There is a bone devil that stands before you. He is a large fiend. They have a fly speed of 40. They have fiendish resistances, so cold, mundane, and unsilvered weapons. Fire and poison are immunities. They have passive perception of 12, so that's fun. They have magic resistance. They have multi-attack with two claws and a sting that does extra poison damage, which is fun. If it hits you, then you have to make a constitution save versus the poison condition. How do we all feel about that? Mmm, tasty. Just another Monday. This room also holds four or Incubus and Succubus varieties. Incubus and Succubus have fly speed of 60. They have, we'll call this Fiend Light resistances, so they resist cold fire, lightning poison, and non-magical weapon damage. Passive perception of 15, so the rogue don't care. They can claw, and they can charm for a DC 15 wisdom save, or the target is charmed for a day. The charmed target obeys the fiend's verbal or telepathic commands. If it succeeds on any of the saving throws, it is immune to this fiend's charm, meaning you will need to keep track of each of the charms. If they kiss a charm target, they can do a whole bunch of psychic damage with a draining kiss. They can also go ethereal as an action. So that's what's going on here. Terrain. Terrain is quite familiar. You have a pile of dead bodies that are difficult terrain. You've got some benches and shelving units that are difficult terrain. You've got some impassable terrain of the walls around you. This should look quite familiar to everybody. This is an interior space with a 15-foot roof. Did not come up last time. The little round decorative bits, someone of small stature could hide behind those, I assume. Absolutely. Perfect. Tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Hide in the corner to our south? If we can, we should cork them up in there and AoE them. Yes. Especially because that would allow the squishies to hide in the corner to the south. Or the north. Yeah, we can try that. But they all fly, so... Sure, but, you know, if they have to fly through spirit guardians, it's still gonna suck. Do you want me to try to control some of them, maybe? Or just go for the AoE right out the gate? I think go for the AoE. I think the hardest CC here is death. One of you have the Dust of Invisibility, right? I do, and I'm actually thinking about using both that and the Dust of Sneezing and Choking. If we get the advantage here, and if I can go before them, I'm going to disappear us all. If I can get in among them while disappeared or not, I'm going to try and, and sneeze and choke and disable a whole bunch of them. 
but I don't think that either of those is a reliable plan until we know what our initiative is, so. If the initiative goes right, can we try the I cast Spirit Guardian, you invisible me? If the initiative goes right. All right, then. Go ahead and roll initiative. <laughs> well, it was a good plan, guys. <laughs> Anybody have higher than a 20? 23. Who's got between a 20 and a 15? 16 on the owl. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? 14 for the rogue. I've got a 10 on the fiends. 10 on the cleric. And I'm missing a fighter. What do you got for me? Six. Mm. As my post-dressed action, I'm handing my dust of disappearance to someone else. Too late. Wizard, you're up first. Fun, fun, fun. I think they're 150 feet from me, right? Probably. I'm going to sculpt around my friends here and aim for the Bone Devil and Chain Lightning. So anything that's 30 feet, it's going to jump. Tell me about it. You have a DC 17 dex save. Okay, pass with a 20. Or take half. Your damage is going to be 50. So the guy in the middle is going to take 25. Three bolts then leap from that target to as many as three other targets. Who are we going after? Oh, let's go one and two. Hit that north one. The double and the north one? Yeah. And they're going to get plus three, and I need a 17, so I need to roll a 14. One is going to fail and take 50. Number two is going to fail and take 50. And number four going to pass and take 25. Zap, zap. Zap, zap, zap. Anything else? Move southwest in that hole. After that, we're going to go to the owl. 11 to target. Yeah, 11 would keep him in there because he wouldn't be able to get away at that point. Put him north of me and then we'll go from there. After the owl, we're going to go to the rogue. We're going to bonus action, hide behind the cleric, and then we're going to shoot over the cleric's shoulder at the bone devil. Oh, there's the crit. You did it! I did. I did. 14 dice later. 53 points of damage. That's my turn. After the rogue, we're going to go to... We're going to go after the wizard. She's going to fly over here and try to charm you. Give me a DC 15 wisdom save versus charm. You have advantage for a number of reasons. Advantage because I'm an elf and advantage because of that. First one is an 18. You pass. Go ahead and note that you are immune to number two. Okay. This one's going to fly over here and give me another DC 15 wisdom save versus charm. That is 15 on the head. I've dropped the one. You're now immune to number three. Give me a DC 15 wisdom save versus charm. Uh, so one and a 17. And that'll pass. Whew. Dude, I am skating by. <laughs> That's two ones in a row. <laughs> and another DC 15 wisdom save versus charm. Oh, good lord. 19. All right, you're going to pass. And you're immune to all of them now. I don't want the fighter going anywhere, so I'm going to use my 10-foot reach. We're going to dash because we have to. After that, we're going to go to the longfish. Put me diagonal two squares directly behind the two fiends. Eat an RP. Decline the opportunity attack. Okay. I will cast Spirit Guardian at level four. And at turn there. After that, we're going to go to the fear. I'm going to go crazy on the bone devil. Step into him. Attack number one. 26 to hit. Hits. 18 damage. Attack number two. 17 to hit. That misses. Attack number three. 27 to hit. Hits. For 17 damage. Gonna action surge. Attack number four. 22 to hit for 14 damage. Attack number five. Ew, that's gonna miss. That's a three. Attack number six. 24 to hit for 14 damage. One hit point in a dream, baby. And that'll be it for me. After the fear is the Asia Wolf. You got this, buddy. It's a party over here. Shatter. DC <laughs> 17 con, level four. Shout at them really loudly. And that'll hit those sculpting around yourself. Sounds good. 24. 24 or 12. Succubus number one is going to fail and drop. Succubus number two is going to fail and drop. Succubus number three is going to fail and take 24. And succubus number four is going to fail and take 24. Cool. Anything else? Not good. After that, we're going to go to the owl. Let's move Duke Allenton in there and give advantage to the one just south of the cleric for the cleric, actually. And then flies out here. After the owl, we're going to go to the blind oracle. So you're holding that oppie for me, huh? <laughs> I was not. I was holding it to make sure the fighter didn't run south. Okay. Because I didn't want him to schwack all of my succubuses. And it kind of worked. It didn't go south, so. Oh, I think this went south for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really need to worry about this. Let's just shoot the bone devil. Walk over to him and blow gently on him. Hmm? He's got one HP and he's in the zone. Oh, never mind. I don't need to shoot him. You're right. Shoot the succubus. It's in the wizard's face. 17 to hit? 17 hits. 23 points of damage. I don't really want to stand there. <laughs> Bonus action to use those fancy shoes. Now I have a move speed of 50, and you have disadvantage on the attack of opportunity. Just straight the other side. Here's the attack. He's going to get a 15 to hit you. That will miss. 
After the Blind Oracle, we're going to go to the Bone Devil. Bone Devil starts to turn off in the zone. Give me some damage. Spirit Guardian for 21 damage. He gets an 18. He takes half of that and drops. This Succubus starts off in the zone. 18. They fail. 18 points of damage. Oh, one hit point in Dream. We got this. We're going to do this. We're going to go Ethereal. The next one is the other Succubus. The other Succubus gets a 19. Pass, so 17 halves to 8. And he is also going to go Ethereal, which I now realize is not going to be helpful. After that, we're going to go to the Longfish. Uh, huh. I'll dodge and turn. Fear no equal. Stand next to Cleric and prepare to attack the first enemy that I see. After that, we're going to go to the Asia Wolf. I'm going to concentrate on Ray of Frost on the first enemy I see appear. Ow. He's good up there. Just dodge. Blind Oracle. Move into the circle next to the Cleric. I would like to ready an action to shoot the first succubus that appears. Bonus action, throw down a hunting trap in the square in front of the fighter. The succubus is going to walk through the ethereal plane, and her action is going to be to reappear. The other succubus is going to do the exact same thing. All right, that's their actions. After that, we're going to go to the longfish. Dash me towards the incubus. I think I can land on the far side of them. And end turn there. Great, fear. Well, that'll change things. I will dash to next to the cleric. After that, we're going to go to the Azure Wolf. Yeah, I'm going to go at the diagonal until I get in range of one of them. Ray of Frost. The one out of cover? Well, cover really doesn't matter, but yes. Ooh, that's a nat 20. 38. 38 points of damage. They take half, so that'll be 19, and that is lethal. I'm going to wipe my forehead because I'm tired <laughs> at this point. After the Azure Wolf is the owl. <laughs> Go in and let's give that rogue advantage and get away. And then the blind oracle. Walk over, shoot the remaining succubus with advantage. 27 to hit. Yep. 24 damage. Dead. God, that was a bad roll. It had one hit point. All you had to do was connect. I, you know, hey. <laughs> Report hit points. Oddly enough, I'm still at 109. 132 <laughs> of 134. 125 of 126. 159 of 159. Any post-encounter actions? Recover the hunting trap. Yep. I will use my last second level spell slot and warding bond the fighter again. Warding bond the fighter, okay. The full extent of the ritual has been determined, and all that is left is to see what was summoned by all of these bodies. The adventure is going to continue onward to the next room and see what is going to meet them there. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. 109 hit point. In hand is my Wand of the War Mage plus one. Wand of Magic Missiles, two slots remaining. Four first level, three third, three second, one third, two fourth, two fifth. 132 out of 134, holding a plus one short bow. Eight minutes on boots of speed remaining. A 125 out of 126, holding the staff of Python and shield plus one. Four level one, three level three, and two level four spell slots remaining, and both charges of my channel divinity. And the warning bond is up between the fighter and I. 159 out of 159, AC is 20 due to warding bond. I have second wind and indomitable still available. I have a great axe plus two in hand. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. Monster, Arcanaloth. An Arcanaloth is a mercenary spellcaster of the lower planes. That's what has been summoned here by the sacrifice of unknown number of souls. What is an Arcanaloth exactly? Well, I'm glad you asked. An Arcanaloth has resistance to cold, fire, and lightning. It has resistance to non-magical weapons. They're immune to acid. They're immune to poison. They're immune to the charm condition and the poison condition. They have true sight of 120 and a passive perception of 17. Still not good enough for a rogue. They have innate spell casting, so they can, as many times as they like, cast Alter Self, Darkness, Heat Metal, Invisibility on themselves only, or or magic missile. They have magic resistance against any of the saves that they're going to have to take in this fight. Their weapons count as magical. They also have regular spell casting in addition to their innate spell casting. So they have a bunch of cantrips, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth level slots. Their eighth level slot is mind blank. So this has already cast mind blank on itself and is benefiting from that spell. What is mind blank? Well, I'm glad you asked. Until the spell ends, which happens after 24 hours, a willing creature, which is the Arcanaloth, is immune to psychic damage. Any effect that would sense its emotions or read its thoughts, any divination spells, and the charm condition, it's all immune to that. The Arcanaloth can teleport as an action. It has claws that do poison damage. How do we all feel about poison damage? Like Hero's Feast is the best investment ever. Poison me, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's an Arcanaloth. What else we got? 
terrain and effects. The terrain is quite simple. There's a couple of pieces of difficult terrain. They might look familiar. A couple of stairs upward, some impassable terrain forming walls, pillars that go up to the ceiling here, and a pool of blood, but it's only like ankle deep, so there's no difficult terrain or anything like that. Tactics, what do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Who wants haste? I still think you throw it on the fighter. I actually am not sure about that in this case, because he's got teleport. Mm. I'm probably not going to be able to stay in contact reliably. You are. Yeah, okay. I'll take it. So if you stay in a stairwell and ready to shoot him when he teleports, then you can potentially stay in better contact. My thought with the hasting and the hold action is if he's teleporting, I can reliably get sneak attack on the first attack. Off turn, he's going to teleport. I'm going to be visible to him. I'm never going to get the big bonus damage on that second attack. Yeah, unless he teleports into somebody. Well, the other thing we could do is put one tank in one room and one tank in the other room and stick you and the, the wizard in a stairwell. An air elemental would be helpful here, especially if we're going to split up. So I'm probably going to crack that open. I don't think banishment's going to be worth it on this one. God, it would be funny, though. Yeah, it would. Just ruin Saracen's day. I think you should. I'm going to try it, but it's remembering the conditions he's immune to charm. So hypnotic pattern and polymorph are useless. And polymorph no real better than banishment in this regard. Cleric, you want uh, down or up? I think you should take up so that you can spirit guardians and engage with him more consistently. Yeah, sure. Let's go ahead and roll initiative. That was a good try, buddy. <laughs> Anybody have higher than a 20? The rogue has a 21. I have exactly 20. Who's got between a 20 and a 15? 17 minus 1 on the clerk. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? Who's got between a 10 and a 5? 6 on the owl. I got a 6 as well. 6 on the fighter. All right, rogue. 21, you're up first. First things first, this is a little tougher than I thought it would be. Let's go ahead and click the heels on the boots. Move straight into the alcove. What else? Standard action to hide. After that, we're going to go to the wizard. I need to be 30 feet from the road to haste him. Or haste him. Cool. And then the remainder of my movement is getting to the southeast stairwell. After that, we're going to go to the cleric. Move me to the north of the northeast stairwell. Can I see that guy? Yeah, you got line of sight to him. All right, I will chug a banishment at him. <laughs> the cleric's trying it. What's the range on counterspell? 60 feet. Insight. Hit that with a fourth level counter spell. All right, that cancels out. And turn. After that, we go to the owl. Move him east of me one. Dodge. The Arcanaloth is going to cast Chain Lightning at the Cleric. Give me a DC 17 dexterity save. That's an 18. 54. So you saved. So you're going to take... 27 points of lightning damage. And it's about to hurt. It's going to jump to anything within 30 feet. Fighter, go ahead and give me a DC 17 deck save. Rerolling with Indomitable. Oh, you used it. I failed on that one as well. 54, of which you're going to take 27. Cleric, take another 27. And Rogue, give me a DC 17 dexterity save. Vantage on this from haste. It's a 27 to save. And then you're going to take... Well, I'm going to try to issue to you... 27 points of damage. Then I'm going to say nope. You ignore it with evasion. Dodge that lightning. <laughs> After that, we're going to retreat. I'm going to fly for 30 feet. I'm going to fly to there. After the Arcanaloth, we're going to go to the fear. Move me east. I'm going to crack open that gem. Slam that thing like a pog slammer. Nice reference. 90s kids stand up. <laughs> God, I feel so old. Honestly, I thought we were going to make a Power World reference. <laughs> That's too young. <laughs> What happens for initiative for the elemental? 15. That'll do for me. After that, we're going to go to the blind oracle, top of the order. I now need to ask how much move speed I had, because the boots are going and I've hasted. Are we doubling a double? Yeah, sounds good to me. So I now have 100 feet of move speed. First thing we're going to do is bonus action hide. Then we're going to go five squares south. Yep, right where you just had the cursor. One more on the diagonal. And then take the shot at our fox friend there. 26 to hit. 26 will do it. For 35 points of damage. Retreat to the... There's good. Haste action. You can use the haste action to hide, so I am going to do that. Major Wolf. Trying to get on the stairwell to where I can first see him. He's got three-quarter cover from there. That works. This is about to become a wizard's duel, probably. You ignore half cover when making a spell attack. You're not going to ignore his cover. That's perfectly fine. Magic missile? What level? Four. He's going to throw up a shield. I will counter the shield. Okay, so he's going to take four levels of magic missile. I'm staring at three. Looking at three, three plus one is four, four plus five is nine. Nine times six is 54. Go boom. All right, I'm good where I am, though. Longfish. Move me up to the staircase again so I can see him. And I am going to throw a 
Guiding Bolt at him. Level 4. Whew. 18 to hit. 18 connects. 23 damage. Lethal. Beautiful. Wow. Wow. We only have 100 something hit points. Okay, Ar Arrow Elemental, you can go. Thank you. There's a lot of consumable use there for, uh... I'd rather be over for than under for air. No, 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 hey. Clearing out the Diabolical Cult Temple, the adventurers find a shield plus two, a wand of the War Mage plus two, a potion of flying, and a potion of cloud giant strength. They also get loot worth 42,000 gold, which comes out to 10,500 gold each. The distribution will be shield goes to the cleric, wand goes to the wizard, potion of flying goes to the rogue, and the potion of cloud giant strength goes to the fighter. Of course, that can be rearranged if you guys want it. For once, your distribution seems reasonable. You mean the fighter doesn't want the wand? <laughs> I know how badly you've wanted to dual wield once the War Mage. The next adventure is fighting off the enemies that surround a white dragon tundra. Oh boy! Adventurers will make their way up into the frozen north and see what they have to fight there. By tradition, what did we think was the easiest encounter? The last one? Dub kidding. The first? Yeah. The last one was the <laughs> easiest actual encounter. First one became the easiest encounter by sheer luck. <laughs> yeah, that one actually looked like it was going to be a decent fight. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> from a strict outcomes standpoint. The first one was the one and done. There you go, DMs. Give your big monsters banishment. It wasn't even one and done. It was fourth PC to go, right? Al went first, then Blind Oracle, then Fear No Equal, then Asia Wolves. So yeah, it was a three and done. Big scary monsters, not the big and scary. I think we learned that a long time ago. We've had a couple of the big scaries that were big and scaries. I think even without the banishment, we would have taken damage, but it would have been pretty smooth. We're immune to the poison damage. I guess three attacks a turn, but... X number of attacks back, we win that on attrition over time, doesn't matter. From an attrition standpoint, though, that it's important to note that we used virtually no resources, and that came back to really help us later. We spent one spell, and we lost the owl. There was a research expenditure, but it was the appropriate research expenditure. You, you had to spend one fourth level slot, you spent it, and you got really lucky. Absolutely the way to go for that fun. Longfish, you agree, disagree? Other thoughts about what was easy? Definitely the last one. Yeah, just like, I'm going to throw all the spell slots I have at this guy. Is it universally like that? Or have there been situations when you guys are in the last fight going, oh, actually, this is kind of tough. We're out of stuff to throw. A long time ago when we were fighting those shades, I think that was the hardest, like, last fight. But yeah, overall, I think we conserve enough resources so that, like, last fight, everybody goes over. I personally think we've had a couple since then, but yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement that I was going to mention that tonight is that I'm either I'm getting really good at conserving my slots, because, I mean, I've got a crap ton of slots left over. And I'm sitting there going, well okay or we're just getting that good at steamrolling or our strategy is getting really good and the sheer number of spell slots that you have at this point you can afford to dump three spell slots per fight that's not the case with a low level wizard but like now you can just do it you can just go for it and then you have arcane recovery and can recover a bunch of them back definitely using the scrolls helped with the management too in this because i use two of them for haste and one of them for mage armor that's three slots right there that i saved yeah at this point where I've given you more access to resources that you can purchase, I've also given you more gold that you can use to purchase resources. The lower level spells, you should probably just be flush with scrolls and able to throw stuff all over the place. So it also kind of changes what your prep philosophy is going to be. And we'll kind of see that perhaps later. Well, I've been trying to find that sweet spot now because, I mean, I think if I remember right, the last encounter I had fifth level slots left over. This one, I've got both of them. And I've got one fourth level slot. I've got all my first, all my second. What was the most difficult encounter? The beast one? Yeah. What made this difficult, I guess, is the question. I have a couple of ideas, but what do you guys think made this difficult? For me, magic resistance through the whole, the whole dungeon. That's true of all of the encounters. What made this one difficult? Or they have resistance to ice or poison. Every devil in here that was true of. So what made this encounter? I think this one, to me, it was that breath move could get a little nasty a lot of targets a lot of aoe so there was two aoe but i know what you mean two more than most of the other encounters we had to respect that they were repeatable they could recharge that's true that said our man the cleric has the most aoe so yeah that was impressive like this whole like dungeon for the cleric just the amount of tanking that was done the amount of raw aoe output that was done was incredibly impressive it's like the first time in forever i actually have to go tank damage well part of that was warding bond you chose to tank a bunch of damage for me and unfortunately i can't cast the warding bond and tank damage for you because i've got all the hp 
What I was excited about with Warding Bond is every time you take damage, you have to make a concentration save. You could dodge, I could hit the fighter, and then you would take a bunch of damage. You haven't failed that many concentration saves, so it didn't really matter. But did anybody disagree that this was the hardest? Potentially, that succubus one with the Bone Devil could have been crazy. All those charms, if they would have went off. I mean, I've dropped three ones. That advantage from being an elf and from the wisdom save really kicked in because I dropped three ones. I would note that while the second encounter was challenging, I think we handled it very well. I have a bunch of notes on like even though we changed our tactics we responded to the situation very well and took advantage of it so i don't think that that was necessarily the most difficult one the chain devils almost were we sorted that out pretty well and the fifth one the bone devil could have been very very bad if you hadn't targeted the most resilient charm targets the fighter and the rogue would have been much, much more difficult to break those charms. I was surprised you did not try and charm the rogue here, given that I'm rolling at flat dice to resist that charm. With the wizard, he rolls up and throws a, a six level spell. I was like, okay, well, definitely hurt. But if I can just command him to do that on you guys, he's been saving fireballs because we're all immune to fire. It's like, okay, we'll start fireballing your friends. Yep, I got a whole bunch of fireball scrolls. We can turn all of that <laughs> stuff around. I also think you made a mistake in this encounter. I think succubi are, are resistant to lightning. I only know this because this has come up in one of my games. Yep, they absolutely are. What would that have changed? I mean, it would be a little bit extra damage. Fight would have gone on a little bit longer. One more turn of charms. Yeah, because you guys killed the Bone Devil before you finished off all the succubi. Now we're trying to figure out, can we break concentration on the charm? Well, the answer is no, because it's not a concentration effect. You have to hit the person. What you would want to do there is you'd want to throw magic missiles at the person to give them as many saves against the effect. You hit the succubus, it doesn't matter. If you kill the succubus, though. If you kill the succubus, they can't issue any orders, and there's no one for them to not be able to attack against so the effectively the charm ends technically it doesn't but you're right yeah and it's basically at that point to an arm strike to wake them the hell up first of all you gotta hit you guys are not easy to hit second of all that's only a single save that they get to make so you want to do something like magic missile that does repeated strikes so an arm strike from the fighter i mean that's a bunch of damage but he's going to be able to make three attacks against you so that would be a good shot but it's very much like cracking a concentration but you're doing it on the person affected by it rather than the person casting it you just want us to be on the receiving end of the magic missile barrage sometimes yeah of course i do doesn't lesser restoration take care of that too it's a charm effect it's not a spell it's not a curse it's not a disease it's not a poison there's one cleric spell that can crack it but it's pretty high protection from evil and good i think will suppress a charm effect mind blank eighth level wizard spell there's a couple of things that specifically prevent sort of possession and charm and fear and stuff like that so those sorts of things would do it the magic answer is protection from evil and good you know what it is being an elf well it's only advantage they're not immune to it and all of you guys have an advantage on wisdom saves from Heroes Feast. So Heroes Feast, again, a fantastic decision for the format of these encounters. Huge value proposition, yeah. Especially at the point now where it's like, okay, we'll be we raked in 42,000 gold. So yeah, we'll spend a thousand of that on a whole bunch of benefits. <laughs> Notes are not going to be fantastic. All I have is that this is a tank. I think we called Banishment actually as the Hail Mary just to see what happened here. In practical terms, we talked about like locking her down. Try to duke it out with her at, long, at a ranged fight. Because she could fly and we we're outdoors. Yeah, that's... That was a quick one. Any other thoughts about the big scary spell encounter? I would note that she is the only one who survived. <laughs> Well, no, they all go back to their planes. That's the nature of fiends. She's the only one who did it without getting mauled. Your tactic here that you guys talked about in the front was to back up into the corner. I guess bottleneck them or something. What was that idea about? So the initial plan was to try and bottleneck them at the doors. Despite the fact that we did the opposite thing, not only was it the right call, but what we did accomplish, we couldn't have accomplished if we hadn't done that. If we had gone straight into the middle of the room, we were dealing with a surrounding area enemy, you know, multiple range casters on all sides of us. Instead, we forced them all to come down into Spirit Guardian Zone. And because they came down to peek the doors, because they all lined up like that to respond to us being in the corner, we could come right back out and close to grips with them where they were all in Spirit Guardian Radius. It was the moment where breaking our suggested tactic was exactly the right move, but it was only set up because we did the thing. By backing up into the corner where they could still hit you, you baited them into charging forward, which is what you wanted them to do. We drew them into a clump, which is what we needed to do and what we didn't have the ability to do with them spread around the room initially. Spirit Guardians wasn't the powerhouse that it was once we pulled them all down to those doors and the cleric came back out swinging. So if we hadn't baited them down in like that, if they had just sort of sat there and sent the hellhounds in at us, it would have been a different story. Yeah, we were able to funnel them to a position that was advantageous for us. 
We had some concentration of fire issues, but that's just because it's hard to explain who you're targeting. Some of it we ran into was was the off-action attempted sneak attack, which I am used to reserved actions or held actions needing to be very, very specific. If you're saying, hey, I want to attack the things that are attacking my friends if they attack on their turn, if we're saying that's a perfectly valid held action, that that makes this a lot easier. Here's what ready says. To do so, you can take the ready action on your turn, which lets you act using your reaction before the start of your next turn. First, decide what perceivable circumstance will trigger your reaction. Then you choose the action you will take in response to the trigger, or you choose to move up to your speed to do it. If the trigger occurs, you can either take your reaction right after the trigger finishes, or you can ignore the trigger. And that worked fine for the first one, where we kind of got tripped up was me trying to take the extra attack actions, because you were very clever when I said, if something attacks the fighter, I want to attack it. That was very clever, where you decided to attack the cleric instead. And it was like, okay, if something moves out of the spirit guardians, or tries to move out of the spirit guardians, I'm going to attack that. Maybe you will try to pull forces out and disengage and throw fire back at us, but it was a little bit of chess and cat and mouse there. And I think some of it is because I was overly specific with the actions, because that's what I'm used to. And some of it is just that this is always going to be cat and mouse if we get in that situation, because you're not going to want to eat the reaction attack from the rogue with full sneak dice behind it. The perceivable actions that I would imagine are, I'm going to shoot at a target that would give me sneak dice. Entirely perceivable. We usually say shoot at a target that takes a hostile action. Honestly, there's things like, I'm going to wait for the fighter to move. Okay, well, the fighter goes to swing. It's like, great, now I'm going to shoot. There's things that you know, exactly what you said, like a cat and mouse sort of thing. Oh, you say, okay, well, I'm going to attack if anybody attacks a fighter. It's like, well, I just want to attack the fighter. But if you set them up so that I'm going to attack whenever the fighter attacks somebody, then your allies are playing cat and mouse, but you're both on the same team. The allies can trigger things for you. Like you said, you're used to a more specific level of condition. I think that is very much going to vary table by table. Rules as written, it says, first you decide what perceivable circumstance will trigger your reaction. Perceivable circumstance. I perceive time moving and then it'll trigger. You know, like <laughs> I, I perceive dust motes going in and I'm going to shoot that guy. You know, like that level of perception. And so I think the rules as written, there's a lot of leeway that a player has. And, you know, the GM gets this too, but there's a lot of leeway that the player has to say what is perceivable and then it's kind of uh, like you said later as a kind of a mother may I situation does this count or not on the subject of GM leeway and cat and mouse the game doesn't have very many tools for a player to manipulate the GM something like I'm gonna shoot anyone who attacks the cleric is a great way to encourage the GM to target the people you want him to target even though what you're doing is forcing this by not acting, the cleric was taking an absolute beating. I had above 100 health for the entire dungeon. You can set those conditions with the intention of just pushing the DM not to trigger and doing some control work on what the DM is going to trigger or not. If you just say, I'm going to shoot the first one that tries to move out of Spirit Guardians, and the DM's like, well, I'm not going to move out of Spirit Guardians. Okay, gosh, you know... You don't move out of spirit guardians. What a tragedy. Yeah. I absolutely see how it seemed like I was like, oh, I'm going to intentionally stop Blind Oracle from getting his reaction. I, I promise you that was not my goal. It just lined up very nicely with my other goals. I was just like, oh, there's a bunch of spirit guardians. Better crack that. Because you usually try to hit the fighter because the fighter has less AC. That has been your reasoning in the past. And I was trying to, to play off of that. Not in this encounter. But in this encounter, they were the same. Well, I think it's 19 versus 20. I had warning bond. Warding bond, it was 20 on 20. Uh, oh, never mind. That's the thing. And also, any damage on me was damage on the cleric. Exactly. And half the damage on the fighter went over to the cleric. And the turn the fighter was actually hasted, he got 22. The third encounter, the tactics I wrote down, disable half of them. So that seemed to go well, and then spirit guardians got popped and it broke that. Does anybody have strong thoughts about that process? Yeah, I should have specified that Devil that's incapacitated was also friendly. Yeah, it just has to be a target you can see. You also could have taken a step to the east. That would have taken the Devil out of the radius of Spirit Guardians while still keeping it valid for him should you choose to engage him. 100%. After I had said intern, I was like, should have said move to the east to leave those alone. I was also trying to see, like, Minesweeper, the imp started invisible. That's the only note I had. We broke in cap early and I could have gave a warning. 
but I don't think in the long run it really hurt us because we dropped that one pretty quick shortly after. I think the faint or distract thing is a DM call in general. Mechanically, it says that the imp was assisting by fainting or distracting, but it's invisible, which means you can't faint or distract me in a way that is visually perceivable. That's not true either. Or they can drop like a rock. They can make like some sound of movement. Sound generally is not visibly perceivable. Given that the specific terms were faint or distract, I would say that's generally going to be a DM call. I don't think so. I think the English meaning of that sentence is fairly clear in the sense that all sort of interpretations of GM call, I do agree with what you're saying. Crawford has been fairly clear about the meaning of invisibility, and visibility is not impossible to perceive. Invisibility means you have disadvantage to attack it, it has advantage to hit you. That's kind of what invisible means. The example I give is Predator. I haven't actually seen that movie, but from what I've heard, it's sort of like the weird sort of camouflage outline, which just makes it hard to hit. A creature can be invisible, but you actually know where it is. You can see evidence of it. It is impossible to see without the aid of magic or a special sense. That is the first sentence of the condition. The imp magically turns invisible until it attacks or until its concentration ends as if a spell. The English meaning of those words is pretty clear to me that it doesn't count. I absolutely understand where a GM would say, I'm going to change the way those abilities work and say that using the ready action does do it. And insert my line drop, in cap breaks, freaking grapple. I don't know how I missed that. That was really dumb of me, but of course. Yeah. I went and checked it as soon as I was concerned about grappling. I went and checked. Moving on to the next one. So your tactic here was target the succubus first. Knowing what you know from the fifth encounter, was that the right choice? Yes. Let us pretend that the wizard has a bad day. Now we have a fireball problem. Yeah, okay. Let us pretend the cleric has a bad day. Now we have a level 4 spirit guardian running around. Yeah, exactly. Spirit guardian was already cast with us being friendly, yeah. I could have him recast it. I have a note saying, why did we target the cleric first with charm? He's got the best wisdom save, and the rogue and the fighter are throwing flat dice, or plus one in my case. And I've got three attacks to break concentration with. The answer is there because the cleric and the wizard have AoE. But in this one, there's not much AoE because there's only two enemies. Not from my perspective. I target the rogue and I get some beautiful single target damage. And then the other two guys fix the problem. I target the fighter and I get some red around damage or I get some great single target damage. And then the other two guys fix the problem. Or I target the cleric and I get to hit everybody. That's what I'm saying is I want the AoE on my team now. That's why I was targeting those two. I'm potentially more likely to grab you two, but I can do more with the other two in this situation. If there was only two people, right, if it, like let's say there was just a rogue and a wizard, yeah, I'm grabbing the rogue and telling him to shoot the wizard because I'm more likely to get it and I only need one other target. I, I see where you're going with risk versus reward there. I think the correct option is still to grab the rogue because the rogue kills the wizard and then you're going to have the fighter and the cleric solve the rogue problem really quick. Like they're going to walk up and bonk me and I'm going to see if I shake myself out of it and I've got enough hit points to absorb a beating from the fighter probably. But that's a lot of resources we're down at that point. Action economy. You hit the cleric or the wizard and you're trying to basically use one action to hit three of us. And then we bonk somebody and they're back to normal. But if you hit the fighter, you get the fighter's action and you get whoever undoes the fighter. So you, that's two actions you get. As we saw, it's more reliable. Sure, the same for the cleric. As we also saw, it doesn't matter if you don't hit. You took the high risk for the high reward, which in the four succubus fight, I think makes a lot more sense. You can just keep trying. But with the one succubus fight, I don't think your tolerance for risk is high enough. Your action economy levels out very hard. You know, suddenly you get three attacks and we have effectively two people countering that. I think the action economy is the same regardless of the target. I take one action away from the victim and I take one action away from the care provider. What's the succubus save? 15 wisdom save. Okay, so if you hit me, I have to roll a four or under on two dice. So when he was shooting for me, I hit a 15 on one of mine, and three of my rolls, I dropped at one. Blind Oracle's going to say that he needs a 15 to save, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you get two <laughs> swings at that. I need a 14. Can we agree offensively the cleric and the wizard are the best options for me? And defensively, if I'm trying to reduce the amount of incoming damage to a single target, the rogue and the fighter are the best options. No, I still disagree. I still disagree because you're almost never going to grab me. Yeah, but he could grab me. 
The wizard? I mean, what's your save? Your wisdom save is plus six. So I need an eight or lower for you to fail. It's 40% on two dice is... 16%. Got four bites of that apple. That was close. I think if Hero's Feast wasn't up, grabbing the wizard would have been a smart move. It doesn't matter. Hero's Feast is up or not. You're still an elf. You're going to get advantage on the save. Well, no. So what I was getting at was that at that point, you could literally hypnotic pattern the party and basically in cap them. Maybe not declare it. I think in the fifth encounter, your logic is sound there because you've got enough quarters to spend that you're going to get whoever you're fishing for. I think in this encounter, though, it's it's less sound because picking up the rogue or the fighter does two things for you right away. The first thing is it does it evens out the number of actions per side right away. You go from two to three. More importantly, you can even go to three to two if you pick up the rogue or the fighter and they get the drop on the wizard. Now you're at three to two, and all you have to do is kite out the stunty cleric. What's the cleric's passive perception? Passive perception? Fifteen. You can't spot the rogue unless you go hunting for him, and then now you're not beating on the devil and and and, right? In this encounter in particular, I think the actions are stacked in such a way that just grabbing any of us would have been more beneficial than not grabbing anyone at all. I see what you guys are saying. I think you're overestimating the ability of one of the party members to take out the wizard. Yeah, just have the fighter go grapple the wizard. Can still cast spells. Grapple is just zero movement. Still cast full spells, doesn't even have disadvantage on attack rolls. I do think that just the number of charms that you got off in the one fight versus the other speaks to needing to land the ones you get. It seems like we're not agreeing on the efficacy of the potential here. Can we agree, empirically speaking, that it doesn't matter? Yes, we can. Because out of the five data points we have, it's never effective. So <laughs> Six. There was one other succubus a long time ago. And that was effective on the fighter. You failed the save. Therefore, I should have been targeting the fighter because I knew one out of one time it worked every single time. <laughs> <laughs> Fifth encounter, your tactics were hide, cork up the enemy and AoE, or hide and take pot shots, or do both. What were the thoughts? You didn't really do both. You kind of split up and ran around. Initiative played a lot of part in that, I think. Yeah, that level six at the start was nice, uh, even though it wasn't calculated properly, but still, like you said, we probably would have got one more round out. Are they immune to thunder? I mean, resistant to thunder? No, they're not. Conceivably, if we had known, if we had thought about that, oh, they're resistant to lightning, you probably just could have cranked a, a shatter and picked up, well, not all of them, but more. The chain lightning had a lot of area to it that the shatter doesn't have. Correct. It's a 10 foot spear or a bounce off 30 feet. Well, that's the other thing. It's like you're throwing 50 points of damage at that point. It's like, okay, so you resist it. Have fun. You're still taking 25. Like That's a fireball. I do have a note that it should not have targeted the bone devil. One of the succubi should have been the priority and the other three should have been the chain. We could be pretty confident that they had less HP and we definitely knew that we wanted them off the board faster. Though I changed that targeting slightly later on when the bone devil was right there and I knew he could potentially be taken off the table because he had taken that lightning. But I I think initially we probably wanted to target just the succubi and let the bone devil just sort of sit there and complain about being made of bone. But um, Tish, 100% agree with you. That is one of the times I appreciated the audible call there because I had forgotten that the bone devil only had one HP. I never know how public the information for one HP in a dream actually is. I think it's fun. I think it's goofy. I think it's 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 good content. It rouses up the players to go like, oh, you you know, he has one hit point left. You only missed him by one. Sometimes will backfire. They're like, cool, I wasn't gonna throw this bonus action of an extra attack, but now I will. It kind of depends on the situation, but I think it's an enjoyable part of playing the game to see what they do sometimes. I mean, not with Longfish around, because he's just like, cool, I have Spirit Guardians. They start their turn and die. It's like, all right. <laughs> but what they do with one hit point sometimes, it's fun. I think the wizard saved that one. I mean, the chain lightning and the shatter just completely wrecked them. AOE damage, good. Like uh, That's all there is to it. Final encounter. Wizard, how do you feel about your first wizard's duel? Is this your first wizard's duel? In this campaign, yes. Thoughts? Yeah, it was good. I actually like it. I always like that. I know some people don't like it because counterspell is a hotly debated topic. I get it. But I actually like the way 5e runs counterspell. What's the debate? People say that it's really broken. And it is in a way. It's not very, like, fun for you to cast something cool and the other guy to just say counterspell. Well, okay, now nothing happened and that's just not as engaging as something happening. So I've been in a party with four versions of counterspells on the player side and probably about the same on the monster side and it's a lot of fun to do that. Well, I counter the counter and counter the counter to the counter and blah da 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 until you 
basically do a crazy duel, and it's like, oh, that's kind of fun. As a person who has GM'd for a group that has a lot of magical tricks up their sleeve, I have a, a player who's got silver barbs and a couple of other tricks. They're playing a grave cleric, so they also steal my crits when I crit the players. And they have just a meat mountain of a fighter in that party. So it's like, nope, it's cool. We're going to go to Swarm Tactics. And this is the party where I'm like, nope, everything is just set to deadly. You're going to get through four deadlies in a day. And that's that's what we're doing. And that's part of the reason I can do that is because they're optimized and they're balanced around some things. It's a slightly larger party. I think it's kind of fun on both sides because the parties only have one reaction. Do I use it now? Do I not use it now? Especially with things like Silvery Barbs. I'm like, cool, there's a crit on the table. Especially when things like damage numbers aren't always public in that game, it really makes the players think about when they want to use that reaction, so I, I enjoy that as a DM and as a player. Last time I got to really do this and drive a DM up the wall, I was playing Eldritch Knight with just all of the stay alive tech possible, and they're like, I can't kill you. I'm like, that's great. Throw everything you have at me and I will steal all of it because that's that much less you have to throw at the rest of the party. In the counterspell of this one, it was like taking your reaction away, and it was like, okay, I'm either going to give up my shield or counter this, and I I think my thought with this was that I've got that brooch. And so having that, I'm like, all right, if he throws a magic missile, which he has, I'll just block it with the brooch of shielding. Yeah, he can't upcast the magic missiles, though. I also had a full tank of gas, so I was going to be throwing something else instead. I was thinking you were going to go that to try to break the haste. Oh, I hadn't even considered that. Yeah, no, I think I would rather just hit you guys with a fireball. That was having to weigh, am I going to give up my shield, or am I just going to say, okay, let's risk it? Maps, you guys said some very kind words. You said you enjoyed this, that you're going to try to do the same thing. Our resident curmudgeon, fear no equal. Do you want to curmudgeon about maps? I actually really like these ones. <laughs> All right, so you're not curmudgeon-y, oh, you're contrary. <laughs> Hold on, let me go get a lottery ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Particularly because, you know, we're looking at the sixth encounter map, and, like, we're looking at a two-room space where we had to control, well, we thought we had to control both rooms. I thought the doors in the second encounter allowed us to engage in technical and interesting fashions. We drew them in, and then we countercharged. Like, that is the kind of engagement that I would rather see. Because if we had started on the other side of the doors, very different story. What's different about that story? It, the first thing that happens is we get a lot of produced flames flung at us. Yeah, but you tank the damage and move on. They're not that much damage. 3d6 each. The rogue doesn't tank the damage very happily. Yeah, he does. Right now, the, the rogue tanks damage like a champ. We, we have hit the place where rogues are off tanks now. What's your AC, rogue? A 17... 17, so I need better than 50-50 odds to hit you. And then if I do hit you, what happens? I'm halving it. Halving it once, right? I do 10 points of damage to you. Are you actually going to half the 10, or are you just going to take it? Oh, I'm going to take 10. And you got a life cleric backing you up. And if he's hasted, he's got a 19 AC at that point. If I was not a ranged rogue and was not running around with a bow, I would grab a buckler at this point and just be like a, a competent off tank if I really wanted to. I mean, the wizard is the actual damage threat, but he's got shield. Was he was feasting 80, he's up another 35 hit points today? Yeah, it's it's silly. When I took my stat increase, I went to dex because I was like, let's get a little bit more AC and then stack on some AC to try to make this guy a little harder to hit. These are smaller maps than we've previously had. I also really like that too. We were able to like close engage things within the first turn or so. The smaller maps lend themselves towards faster encounters as well. I think that's one of the reasons that we finished up so quickly. I don't think it was the reason that you finished up so quickly, but I think it was one of the reasons. Speaking of the reason, so you only threw one banishment this entire time. Was it, I'm going to bat a thousand and go out on top? Or like, what was the <laughs> rationale? We did throw a second. We did throw a second, but it got counterspelled. So in the sixth encounter, it was either I was going to throw a banishment or I was going to keep the hay stuff. I was weighing it. I was like, okay, if, if we can't finish it this round, do I throw the banishment and drop haste because it's a concentration? Like I said, I was kind of weighing all that at that point when I was coming up on the stairs. Magic resistance, honestly, is what was holding me back from putting banishment on everything them have an advantage which i get you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take but at the same time i was like could i've been more effective and honestly i probably could have thrown some more banishments looking at my spell slots now i do think it's valuable to recognize when even if something is successful once to recognize when that is very unlikely and not chase that again yeah blind oracle you had some questions about who the best target of haste is Knowing what you know now about my interpretation for the ready action for rogues, 
I still think it's fighter. I think if the fighter can go Nova like he did, great. Throw it on the fighter. Let him go Nova. All he gets is an extra attack. That doesn't change anything about the Nova turn. It does change the distance, which I guess is a benefit. This would also matter more if the fighter was rocking something like Great Weapon Mastery or had a really gnarly magical weapon. Great Weapon Mastery changes the math on that a lot. If the fighter can run over, bonk the tar out of something, pick up a kill to trigger the bonus action attack, like all of a sudden the fighter's just running around smashing things. It's amazing to watch when that happens. Maybe, maybe not. I think it depends on the map. I think it depends on the needs. The archery rogue doesn't need to run around, and I've got my own mobility tools now. It's not a hard requirement anymore. No, but watching you do -si do is kind of fun. One of the biggest values the fighter really gets out of it is being able to close with his targets, which is not always something that he can do. But if he can, then it's probably more value on the rogue. Yeah, situational. Especially if you could pop those two rounds of sneak back to back. That being said, next level, oddly enough, Thief finally gets like its good action, so now I can just bring my own haste. What do you get? Use magic device. I think if I had not goofed some of the activations on the ready to action, I think that it would have helped some. I also don't always know that it's the right answer because those aren't guaranteed to be sneak attacks. This encounter is a great example of that because if the guy can teleport to a place where I, oh, hey, look, there's the rogue teleport. Sure, I'll get the attack. And that's useful and great. The average 10 points of damage and every hit counts. But it's not always going to be a sneak attack depending on terrain and features and this, that, and the other. It's finicky. Could I have done better with it? Absolutely. Could I have gotten more damage out of it? Absolutely. Is there merit to go both ways with it? I'm going to change my tune and say, yeah, maybe it is a bit more situational than always throw it on the fighter. But I think there's also a lot of merit for putting haste on the fighter. I agree with you. It's a situational thing. And I think that's where I'm trying to learn like, what situation is better than the other. The fighter gets one extra attack. And the fighter's benefit is not in getting one extra attack. The fighter's benefit is getting the entire turn worth of attacks. So I think that part of it, it goes to the rogue. The fighter gets more mobility, which the fighter needs, and the rogue doesn't, because the rogue's like, well, I got 80 feet of movement in this arrow here, so that'll fix a lot of problems. Where the fighter's like, well, I got to get to the target. The other thing about getting to the target, once the fighter gets to the target, it locks it down or threatens an opportunity attack, which the rogue doesn't. The rogue's like, well, yeah, I'll take the oppie, but I'm not getting sneak on it. I'm not getting this. I'm not getting that. So it's not really that scary of an oppie. So that's actually adding two attacks to the fighter one for the haste attack and one for the threatened reaction so at that point it's kind of becoming more of a wash so i think that kind of closes the distance for me about which one is better but yeah i think it's absolutely going to be based on the opportunity if the rogue's like no man i got clear field of fire i got cover i got everything i need i'm good here the fighter's like well i got a long way to truck so the haste might be better on one than the other what you're saying is haste is just a movement spell the mobility makes the difference really yes it does the mobility is important i would also not discount the defensive aspect aspect of haste either. I think that's the thing we're selling a little short here. Two AC and advantage on deck saves is nothing to sneeze at. Haste is also that double-edged coin too, so if my concentration gets broke on it, you lock down whoever's hasted, be it the rogue or the fighter, and that can suck. Yeah. What would you guys think was the most enjoyable of these? For me, number one. <laughs> Was it? <laughs> he did kind of solo that encounter. The, the shock! Like, I was just amazed. <laughs> The encounter setup wasn't fun. The <laughs> events that happened. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> I mean, I took eight damage and I was like, banish. <laughs> I really liked the second one. I thought that that one was a fun one to sort out and respond to. That one I was thinking, like, I could move down and use my interact object to, like, shut the door so the dogs couldn't come in and just keep opening it and shooting. And I mean, number two was definitely a funny fight where, like, accidentally going Nova actually worked. You used more channel divinities in this one than I think you ever have in combats previous. And I know what the reason is, because you need the health, but any thoughts about about that it actually worked out the way like the targeting system works because usually like nobody ever goes below half health i have a lot i do a lot not unless you seriously got a drop on the wizard even like the the elemental battle i think that was the last time like i had to pop one where it's just like oh somebody got more than 20 hit points back yeah, the, a lot of them at the time, it's like, well, I'm about to get two of these back. Does anybody need them during a short rest? Being able to actually use it and being able to like actually tank damage, I think the Warding Bond was actually working out. Do you think the fighter was the best choice for Warding Bond? Or put it on somebody else, like either the Wizard or the Rogue? I mean, I was thinking putting it on the Rogue. But at the same time, the rogue can just disengage. We make sure the wizard doesn't get into the fight. It's happened a lot more. I mean, I was surrounded in this encounter. The succubus pylon, if you will. I'm just attractive. What can I say? <laughs> I believe at that point it's called an orgy. <laughs>
I didn't say it. I feel like usually the fighter has to like spend a lot of time closing in distance, getting shot at. That's true. I will note that if we are anticipating the warding bond, you probably want to include yourself in the aid. Because that was a 20 HP deficit. I didn't duck below 100. You probably could have left me out of the aid and included yourself, and that would have leveled us off a little more. Yeah. Or drop it on the wizard and keep yourself in the aid loop to give those extra points of, of cushion. Maybe I should have dropped the dropped the one on the fighter, put it on myself. It's the equivalent of like what forty HP. I was just curious because I've only seen it used in one other game that I've played in five E, and I was like, was this the best choice, or do you think you'd probably use it on somebody else type thing? It seems like the cleric wants to be the recipient of it rather than the caster of it. Someone else is like, hey, I'll keep you up as long as you keep healing. But unfortunately, that's not how that spell works. A warlock could do it. Bard could do it. I think Paladins have it. Paladin is the right choice for that. If you can't have the Cleric be the recipient, you want him to prioritize targeting people who have less HP than he does. Those are the guys who need that effective HP increase. If you throw it on somebody who has one hit point, but they never get hit, then it doesn't do anything. It's going to be the person who's going to be making the most use out of it. You put it on the wizard, and I didn't take any damage for the entire campaign run. It was wasted. You never drop below 100 this entire fight. Well, you were at 150. Let's say you did drop to 100 exactly. That means you took 50 hit points, and then you would have taken another 50 hit points from all of the damage that the cleric absorbed. Under the rubric that the only HP point that matters is the last one, I have 150 HP worth of padding before I get to the last one. Somebody with lower AC than me, or who takes a, a single really big hit that could really put them in danger, I can act effectively all the way down to 5 HP. You shouldn't look at a situation where you're like, oh, I have one hit point, let's do this. And I have 100 hit points, let's do this. Like, you're not going to feel the same way about both of those. One of them is like, eh, it's time to disengage and move away. Get some healing hints and stop taking this damage because I'm about to drop. So him keeping you up keeps you from ever having that fear of, I need to retreat now. It solidifies the front line. Whereas solidifying the back line of like, oh, the wizard has a whole bunch of hit points. It's like, well, yeah, but he shouldn't be taking any damage in the first place. Which is fine if we can control that. But we can't always. Take a big hit, you mean like dropping 300 feet? Right. <laughs> yeah, you would have survived that. Mordic Bond would have been great on him there. Not this again. <laughs> Any other thoughts before we wrap up? I'm going to need to buy another darn gem. Yeah, that was... Good to see an elemental. On the one hand, we have the Banish that is just 100% effective. Great job, no notes. And on the other hand, we have Air Elemental that's just like, why are you even here? This is the second Air Elemental we summoned? Yes, yes it is. So we're 50-50 on our Air Elementals. <laughs> You're 100% of it going off successfully. The next dungeon is White Dragon Tundra. So you have a whole bunch of Tundra and snow-related creatures, and then a White Dragon to fight at the end. So that should be nice and fun. I see some fireballs. You're going to be able to go back <laughs> to fireball throwing, which you haven't done in an entire dungeon. I need to actually spend all the money I'm sitting on. You do. We hit 12. Are we changing our spacing on magic items? Like, are we looking at rares? The thresholds are by tier, 1 to 4, 5 to 10. At the end of 10 was the point at which you guys could start buying the next tier of things. That's all for the encounters, clearing out a diabolical cult. Next week, we'll continue with level 13 and fighting a white dragon in a frozen tundra. Thank you for stopping by. I'm Sarsen Zero, and I hope to see you then.